Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Atlantic Bushcraft Adventures. So tonight we're going to be just chatting a little bit about some updates with our upcoming camping trip here, and fill you out or fill you in on the latest and greatest on that. And then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, necessity being the mother of invention, hence the name. So little things that we make to make our lives a little simpler while we're out in the bush. Uh, you know, just little nicky nacky things, quick things like this, other tools. Just things to make life a little simpler. So I guess first and foremost, uh, we've kind of hammered down the date for sure at this point. Uh, it's looking like it's going to be June 8th and 9th. So I uh, I, I guess we kind of set that in stone at this point, have we been? Yes. Yes. I, I appear to be frozen, though. I see that. So what's going on there? Oh, there is some motion. All okay. right. Are you back? Yeah, I seem to be back. All right, we're good now. At least on my screen. We're a bit delayed on the other one. so It should catch up there in two seconds. I think that was my end. I accidentally down-closed your window when I thought I just moved it to the back. Okay. So anyway, yeah, it's going to be June 8th and 9th. Uh, Chris is back with us. Hello there again, Chris. It's always a pleasure to have you here, good sir. Hi, Chris. And yeah, so... Um, We've come down to the 8th and 9th. We're definitely taking the motorcycles. I think it's going to be a rain or shine event. Hopefully shine for the love of goodness. I would really like some nice weather to start rolling our way. I mean, here we are just a little more than a week out of June. And it's still 2 degrees outside and rainy and damp and just kind of dreary in general. But Yeah. Yeah, if we get the weather we've been having lately, this could be, in many respects, a miserable trip, especially the drive. Yeah, I mean, and uh, I'm really not looking forward to that, honestly, but... That is the thing that I most dread. Like, if we can get to the woods, we can get kind of in the cover of brush, we can get some tarps up, we get our hammocks set up, we get sleep system set out, we get a little fire going... We'll be okay. I mean, there's no way there's going to be a fire ban with the rain we've been having. Like, it's I don't think we'll have stopped. a fire ban this year, man. It's It just never stopped raining. No. So, getting to the woods, maybe getting a fire might be tricky, but I think the two of us should be, if, if we can't, then, well, we are going to shut down the podcast and never mention bushcraft. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we should be all right that, uh, in that aspect. I mean... Uh... We'll at least get a fire going, but like I said, I'm looking at the forecast now, and yeah. man, it, it's just not looking any better rain-wise. It just keeps looking like it's going to get worse and worse and worse. Yeah, so I think I, I pointed out to you in one of our, our, our messenger chats that the historical average is 18 degrees for the weekend we're gone, and it's like a 55% chance of participation historically on that weekend, so... We are set up for a potentially warm but wet weekend. Um, I'm really hoping it's dry and sunny and not too many bugs. I'm hoping for the perfect weekend. But Oh, I mean, the perfect weekend would, of course, be great. I would just settle for warm at this point. I mean, don't get me wrong. I've camped in cold weather, but it's always nicer when it's warm. Like you said, if we can get there and get our tarps and stuff set up, Staying dry is not so bad, but trying to stay warm is, eh. it's just so much easier when it's already warm out. You know what I mean? Yeah. What? See Chris Hillier's getting ready for a kayaking trip. Oh. All right, there. Finally got our two advertisements out. Took me a second to catch up. Get this off the screen. Boom. All right. Yeah, so we've set our weekend. We've we've kind of got our, our, our gear more or less figured out. Uh, you've got some repairs left to do on your on your your ride. Yeah, um, but at least I got all the parts on hand now. So I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat a little bit and test if it's at all possible. Test some of the equipment this weekend. Uh, there's a, a shade pet food run. I think it is a, like a, a charity bike run. This weekend, I'm hoping to strap a lot of gear to the bike tomorrow and see what's what, and then drive down Friday with it. So we'll see how that works out for me. Maybe yeah. snap some video, and we'll talk about that next week if you are so inclined to do it. 
yeah. I think Saturday's supposed to be a nice day, so it, it's looking like you might have some good weather there. Uh, is it on Saturday or Sunday, the ride? The ride is on Saturday, um, and it's real close to where I have a cabin, so my plan was to drive down Friday night, which is supposed to be kind of cooler and not necessarily that great, and then Sunday would be when today I would come back. It's calling for rainy showers and mild temperatures, so... Um, seven degrees is the number I kind of look for. Once it's over seven, I find it more comfortable on the bike. I don't know where your number sits, but that's... <laughs> okay, so realistically, I'm about the same. Uh, seven to ten degrees, I'm good with that. Once yeah. upon a time, I used to not mind riding even down to sub-zero temperatures as long as there wasn't salt. Uh, and the roads were dry, but man, the older I get, the more fair weathered I am. I'm not going to lie. Well, I find like the, the traction is even heavily affected. Like when you get colder, that bike doesn't have the stop and go that it should have for like pavement. Like I've slid a couple of times where I shouldn't have slid. So on colder days, so I, I, I got that in the back of my mind. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. Oh, no, no. That's that. There's actually some science behind that. So motorcycle tires are designed to operate in warmer weather. If you're going to be driving in cooler weather, you actually have to change your tire compound to something that's way softer, like a rain tire or something like that. Uh, tires are meant to be run, and it, even if you go to the manufacturer's website, most of them will say they want you to run them in 15-plus degree weather and drive yeah. easy for the first half hour of that ride. Um, yeah. now on the racetrack, what we used to say was that unless it's like 20 degrees plus for a week straight, don't even try to ride aggressively because you'll end up flung off into the rhubarb. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can, I can definitely see that. I mean, the, the only thing worse than cold tires is brand new tires. Fortunately, I don't have those on, but I, I've been in that situation. I don't know if you've ever been there, brand new tire, get on the road cracker and see what happens and, and usually it, the tire spins out real or quick. you'll take that first turn and uh you pretend is fluctuating a little uh that could have just been me leaning out a little there chris here see if i can adjust it a little bit on my end try that that might help you out a little bit there buddy does that sound any better chris for anybody that's listening to us and not watching the video chris is kind of our uh our quality ear. Control. Yeah, quality control. That's exactly what he is, is quality control. So, yeah, I got the right microphone. Okay, so that, that looks like it's going a little better on my my end Lucky here, for him, right? he gets the same pay we did. Exactly. <laughs> well, double your pay, Chris, because you're doing <laughs> such a good job. Um, anyway, yeah, so June 8th and 9th, hopefully that Wednesday, uh providing we survive the trip, which is going to be June 12th. Yeah. Uh, we'll have some interesting things to talk about. Maybe a little bit of video. Maybe we'll cover that for the next week or two after the trip. Uh, once again, providing we survive the trip. <laughs> but uh, that's kind of our going forward plans at this point. We're still... We have a pretty good idea where we want to go. We definitely have the date now. Uh, I've gotten my gear narrowed down to what I think I'm going to take. The only thing is now with this cold weather, I was just talking to Ben before we came on, I'm really debating uh, maybe picking up an underquilt. It, it's it's just so cool out, I don't know if I'm going to trust just going with the wool blanket, to be honest with you. No, I, I, I'm a bit of a fan of my underquilt. Uh... I, I, I didn't use it for the first few years. I tried, like, windshield reflectors. I've tried uh, foam mats. I tried just trying to hang a sleeping bag. And, and they're all okay. They all work. They're, they're decent systems. But, honestly, the underquilt is a is a touch better. And it's it, it leaves you with an extra sense of comfort and, and, and security. Uh, so I really do enjoy it. And you... You're in the woods hanging there, and you got a nice warm blanket underneath you and a nice quilt over the top of you. It's it's, it's a nice feeling. It, it feels really good. You can listen to the animals and stuff, and you kind of feel, I don't know, a little better than I have in other places. Like, I've slept underground. I just I don't get the comfort anymore. I mean, some people might still love sleeping underground, and I envy them. <laughs> 
Well, it, generally for me, when it gets this cold, like anything under 10 degrees, I tend to hit the ground because I, I don't have an under quilt. So mm. my go-to has always been bring my ground mat, build up some uh, pine boughs or fir boughs or something, get that layer of cushioning, sleep on my ground mat, nice big fluffy uh, sleeping bag and a nice warm fire. But I, I really want to try and go with the, the hammock this time because that means I can take less with me or hopefully yeah. save a little space or that's the plan. But now with the under quilt and stuff, maybe I'm into it for the exact same space. I don't know. But I, I'm th like you said, everybody that I've ever talked to that does hammock sleeping, they, they've they tried the different foam mats, like you said, the windshield reflectors, even ground mats, like those self-inflating ground mats, which is usually my go-to when it's a little cooler. But um, everybody always says the under quilt's just the better way to go. It gets that layer of air trapped around you, and it just makes you so much more cozy instead of just being okay you're actually cozy and nice and I, I like i said the older i get the more i'm leaning Comfort. towards cozy than just okay the worst part is in the morning and you open up your eyes and you're sitting there and you're saying it's cold out there like that's the thought that goes through your mind and you're like i'm really nice and warm and comfy i'm just gonna stay here and you can't stay there forever eventually you have to get out and that's the worst of it. That is by far the worst part of a hammock is is in the morning knowing that I have to get out. I have to cook my breakfast. I have to do something. I can't stay in here all day because it's friggin' awesome. You know, you're comfortable, you're warm, you're, you're cozy. You're, you're, yeah. yeah, but see, I get that for a very short time, but then once I'm oh, out... As yeah, soon fine. as I get out and I'm moving, I'm like, oh, I actually like the crisp coolness. It makes me feel good. But it's that, like you said, it's that momentary second where you're just like, it's so cozy here. Why can't I just stay in my cocoon? <laughs> That's actually exactly what Melissa has told me before uh, when we've been out camping. When we go together, we're big fans of bringing air mattresses. We sleep yeah. in with a lot of creature comforts because if we're going out camping, we don't... Uh, we do the bushcrafting, roughing it thing, but we like to go out and just enjoy it a little. So we bring the air mattress, and sometimes we bring the the little one there, and it's it's easier for her and easier for us and everything else in and around. So, but uh, yeah, yeah, it, it, it's going to be an interesting time depending on weather. And back when we originally planned this, I was like, oh my god, it's going to be June. It's probably going to be too hot to even worry about an under quilt. Probably going to have to pick or pack my light sleeping bag. And now I'm like, you know what? <laughs> Half thinking about a hot tent and a stove. <laughs> well, have you have you discovered where we can get a hot tent? We, we tried bagging. Nobody I, offered it off. Like, I begged and pleaded. Know. Now I'm looking at buying. I'm not lying. Because I am I'm dead set. I'm going to do some in-depth winter camping one of these years. And I'm thinking hot tent's the way to go. Because once again, oh. I like my comforts. I don't like laying on the ground. The bones hurt. Everything's stiff. I'm too fat and old for that now. So just... I'm going to go still bushcrafting, but bushcrafting in luxury. Bushcrafting plus. <laughs> I'm not quite to the Howard Johnson yet being the bushcrafting of choice, but uh, slowly, maybe another 20 years. <clears throat> I, I I definitely think the, the hot tent's a great idea. And, and I think there's probably some decent budget methods to do it. Uh, and it's this is something we'll probably explore in the future. Um Figuring out how we can set up different systems for that. Um, but yeah, I guess we should uh, move on a little bit. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. So we, we decided last time that we were going to talk a bit about what are we going to do when we are in the woods? What, what do you do to, what's your, your uh, what are the tools you make at a necessity or efficiency? I, I want to throw that one in there. I don't think we really discussed that word, but there's an advantage. Anything you make, I mean, I think we both have some wooden spoons and stuff, but any, a lot of tools you can make and sort of carry in, you've saved yourself that room and that weight. Now, you know, a single spoon doesn't weigh a lot, but 10 pegs, you add, add a bunch of 10 pegs, that starts to add up. You make a little tripod over your fire, you know, Tripod can weigh quite a bit. You can save a lot of room. But then there's stuff that's just, you didn't know you needed when you went there. But if you have the skills to do a little bit of carving, what what are some of the things that the listeners or yourself or, or myself, 
what are some things you like to make do? And some of it might be for entertainment. I think I, I briefly showed you these before we went on. And I'm never going to get it on the camera in the there right spot. There you go. Perfect. Nope. Looks good right there. Uh, yeah, I carve these little guys every now and then. Um, I've carved little elves and dwarf type people and cool little masks and stuff. And it's just fun. It's it's entertaining. It keeps you busy. Uh, but there's more practical things. Uh, you showed a really neat device there a few minutes before we started that you make. Um, oh, my, uh, <laughs> my poor man fork. <laughs> yes. And Very yeah. simple. I, I've never made one, uh, but the concept's great. And I can I can see how it would be useful. So we'll get Quick, that up there easy. a little closer. And yeah, it, it's literally just a hardwood bow. Uh, you split it, peel it, and put a little toggle in the middle just to keep it separated. And I mean, this is my go-to utensil of choice for eating because it literally does make a nice little fork. The further you split it and put your toggle in, you can get a wider or narrower pitch. I mean, it's... I threw this one together just a few minutes before we actually started the podcast. So, I mean, they take no time. Uh, and it saves me from taking forks with me because I don't like taking a fork in my bag. Uh, simply because I've had bad experiences with forks in my bags. And there's a hundred ways to stop the bad experiences. And I 100% know that. But, I mean, the one that sticks in my mind is I was packing up. I threw it in the bag, said, oh, I'll get to it later. And it ended up puncturing like a bunch of my stuff. Oh, so no. I was just like, you know what? That's it. I'm never taking a fork again. I moved on to the sporks, the plastic. It's not even a spork. It's like a kaspuka fork or something. It's got the knife, fork, spoon, all that mangled into one. But then I started doing these. And uh, I got the idea from these on a fishing spear. I was trying to do spear fishing, which I failed miserably at. Ended up using the, the rod and reel. And then I was cooking them, and I realized I didn't have anything to eat it with because I'd forgotten my spoon or fork or whatever you want to call it at home. And I just nabbed one of these together and you know what it worked great so i started using them more and more and more and more and now it's literally like i said my go-to eating utensil of choice just for its simplicity it takes no time and now i don't have to worry about anything else i mean the other one i do is the classic it's not really like the spoon per se it's you get the handle and it's just kind of like uh almost looks like a spatula it's more like a a food shovel than a food spoon i'll go yeah. with that too if i'm eating rice or something that's a little too thin to be picked up with the fork. But this here, man, this, like even rice, if it's somewhat sticky, you can eat that with it. Uh, rice and tuna is a big one I go with because it's just a can of tuna for your protein and stuff like that. And some white rice or whole grain rice. Uh, I guess what I take is the bu uh, basmati. I don't know. I think it's the basmati if I'm saying that right, rice. And it tends to stick together a little bit more. And that makes a good meal. And you just eat it with one of those. And man, Bob's your uncle. But uh, getting to your little carvings there, I think those are the neatest thing ever. I always, I tried doing it. I don't have the fine details to be able to do that stuff. And what a lot of people may not realize is entertainment or keeping your mind occupied when you're in the woods, especially if you're there for any amount of time, is incredibly important. Because if your mind starts to wander, days start to seem long, the time starts to seem long, chores start to get monotonous. It just, it creates a real bad vibe real fast if you're not keeping yourself uh, not only busy, but entertained while you're there. You have to be doing something that you enjoy. Uh, so, like for you there, the, the little wood sprite carvings, other people will bring small instruments like uh, harmonicas or whatever those things are where you blow on it and it's like doings. I can't remember what they're called. Harp. What are they? Jaw, jaw harps. Or jaw harp. That's exactly it. Yeah, uh, I I don't have a musical bone in my body. I am probably the least musical person alive, and that's that's not an exaggeration in the least. So, but I do have a bit of an artistic side, and that's with like the, the wood sprites. But the other thing is, if you can carve something like this, then trying to do something in intricate that you want to do for like a, maybe a trap or other device, it gets a lot easier because you're honing your skill. So it's you know, trying to do something that's a bit different. I mean, there's some challenging things I've seen people do out there and, and tricks that that are really neat. I'll be the first one to admit, like, when it comes to notches and stuff like that, I know the concept, I can do them. I cheated them. Something horrible. I always bring a small saw, uh, which I don't have my multi-tool right here on my desk, which is weird. Um... But there's a small saw in that, and I use that religiously to cheat at my notches and stuff like that. Like, I'll use my small saw to build a big saw. 
is what I always say. Like, why do you bring a small saw if you already have the buck saw blade with you? Well, it makes it so much easier to make that big saw. It makes it so much easier to cut things off at precise lengths. It makes it so much easier just to carve a notching because all you gotta do is saw it in, saw it up, and it pops right out. You don't have to worry about going too deep or splitting it and stuff like that. So I cheat religiously when it comes to notches. And uh, one I'm thinking of big time is like a potholder notch where it's kind of the little triangle up and you'll hang a stick on another stick to hang a pot. Yeah. Uh, I've gotten somewhat favorable with that one because it's so easy to do, especially when you have a saw. And uh, m the pure enthusiasts out there will be like, oh, you got to do it with a knife. And my two cents on that is you can do it whatever way makes it easy and functional. So and if you got the saw and, and like a small saw with small teeth gives you that you can't get with a buck saw. Like the worst thing I find trying to do a precise cut with a buck saw is the first couple of, of passes trying to get that because it tears, the, you know. Oh, for sure. A giant set of teeth doesn't do a good initial cut. Once you get it going, it's fine. But um, I used uh, I used to keep a fire striker or a fair seam rod striker, which is just a half length of hacksaw. And everybody yeah. says, well, that's too long. And you no, know, it's not because it still has all the teeth on the back. And that used to be great for getting those fine little cuts started so you could actually get in there with a bigger saw and work at them. And then I since upgraded to my multi-tool, which has fine teeth on it, and I don't need it anymore, but still. I Like I said, I don't... I'm all for being 100% authentic and doing everything with just a knife, like the the one knife challenge or whatever that, you do everything with a knife. Good on you, have at her. I tend to take the lazier way, I guess, but it's, to me it still works. Yeah, I mean... I one of the, the the knife I tend to carve these with, I tend to use the one blade, but I, it has six or seven different blades on it. Hmm. Right, I've got like a spoon blade, I got a, a cornered blade, and I got like a flat chipping blade. There's there's a whole bunch of options on there, and it allows you to have that precision. I mean, is that a cheat? Any more? It's no more of a cheat really than a saw, you know. I don't believe in there's cheats, to be honest with you. I say I'm cheating, but I, I don't believe in cheating. There's just different ways of doing the same thing. There's no... You, Sorry, go you ahead. Carried that, you carried that tool in, and you're using that tool. That's that's the point. You can get into woods with the tools you brought. If you could carry a chainsaw in and do the work with a chainsaw, more power to you. I think it would be foolish because you got to carry you know, a gallon worth of fuel and a 45-pound chainsaw and a handful of files and all this you know chainsaw oil it's it's a lot of weight and unless you're going to be cutting down a small forest an axe or a buck saw will probably do what you're going to do on a, on a weekend trip right uh and those little folding saws what do they weigh they don't weigh any more than a knife they don't weigh the small ones weigh less than an axe by far and a knife and that's the thing. I'm going to carry my multi-tool in come hell or high water. Because, I mean, to me, it's an essential part of being in the woods just because it is a multi-tool. It has multiple uses. And you'll be surprised at what uses you actually get out of that tool that you weren't even expecting to use it for. I, I, I think a multi-tool is an essential part of your everyday life. Like, it's not yeah, a Yeah, you, you get what I mean. Like, now that I don't work with natural resources, I don't carry it as often. But when I worked with them, it was always on my hip at every single time. I, I, I have a series of, of multi-tools, Swiss Army knives and stuff that I switch through on a regular basis. But I always have at least one in my pocket. And I don't think there's been a day go by where it hasn't been an advantage. It hasn't been useful to me. I haven't taken it out to do something. And some people say, well, why do you carry a knife? Why wouldn't you? Like, I was about to say, why don't you carry a knife? It would be my question. But it's it's kind of a societal thing. Like, people are almost afraid of it. They're, they're shy, they shy away from it. Like carrying a knife is some kind of... Like, the last thing I'm going to do is stab someone with this. Like, it's, it's not going to efficiently hurt anyone. No. And it's just going to get me in trouble. But... A co-worker today said, do you have a can opener? Well, I do. I do have a can opener in my pocket at all times, right? Well, that's what I mean. You don't realize what you're going to use it for until you have the option of having that there to be used. Uh, a guy I used to work with at Natural Resources, I did, I'm going to divulge a little here to a, a story. I won't mention names. Everybody gave him a hard time because he used to wear a fixed blade on his hip. 
And I had no problems with it because, I mean, to me, sure, why not? He liked having his knife. He he wore it on his hip. They did. They gave him a bad rep because he was like, "Oh, why does he need that?" And I'm like, "The guy works in the woods. He does the same job I do. He is in the woods 95 percent of the time. Why wouldn't you have a knife with you? Like, I mean, I think it's Nova Scotia law. If you go out into the woods, you're supposed to have a knife, a method of fire making, and some sort of uh, um, what's Compass. the word? I'm not compass court uh well yeah compass by default but compass gps map uh a navigational tool it's the yeah. the word i was looking for yeah. so but, i mean he wasn't doing anything wrong in my eyes but he used to get such a bad a bad rep from people just because he had and it wasn't even a big knife it was like a little four inch skinner knife like, i mean once again what are you gonna do with that but i, th I think the law you're, you're referring to i think i've had to look it up a few times now it is under the hunting regulations so it doesn't necessarily capture someone who's just out for a hike or just – but I think it should. I really think the law should should affect anyone who's who's left, you know, a paved road or gone gone beyond sight of the road. Um, it, and it, I'm pretty sure it does state a compass, matches, and a knife is the minimum requirements that you're expecting. You can be charged if you're in the woods – getting checking your rabbit slips or whatever you can potentially i believe be charged if you get lost or, or stopped by a wildlife officer don't you need a whistle as well or some sort of emergency signaling device i could be there I, I i can't remember it's been a while since i looked up the regs myself to be honest with you but really to me common sense states if you're going to be in the woods you should have the means to to help yourself i mean it's if you're used to carrying a knife, you've already got one third of the of the item, or one quarter, depending on what it is. Compass isn't that big of a deal, and apparently it doesn't have to be the, like a base plate full proper compass. You just need a compass, something that points to north. Yeah, button compasses work fine too, providing it's an actual button compass and not the ones that come on the top of Rambo knives that could be coordinated to. Who knows what? Like, it might point south or east or, like, it's whatever. But, I mean, a decent compass. There has to be a little bit of a quality yeah. assurance there. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah, so, I mean, these these are things that it's a good idea to have. But I've, I've often stated any of these tools, anything you can send someone into woods with is absolutely useless without the skill to use it. I couldn't agree more. And I mean, uh, the, the biggest failing comes with the compass and stuff like that. A lot of people throw them in their bag. Couldn't tell you the first thing about how to use one. Yeah. If you get in there, you're lost. And you have no idea if you went north from the road or south from the road or any idea of what you've been doing. Now you successfully know where north is. But if you don't know where anything else is, you really know nothing. You know, it's not going to help you. I don't want to say this and give people a false sense of security, but I'm going to say it with a disclaimer. I'm saying this simply as a statement of fact more than an assurance. The benefit that we have in Nova Scotia is it's very hard to go in one direction for any real amount of time without hitting a major waterway, railway, or road. Uh, you can't say the same about that in many other provinces, maybe PEI, because you can almost throw a rock across it. But, uh, I mean, you get out in the back country of Ontario, for instance, like in the boreal forest, you could walk 100 kilometers and see nothing but trees. Yeah. And my home province is, there's still a ton of, of woods roads, but there are spots behind my hometown where you could walk for days and not see a road. Um, I believe the number I was told one time, part of my search and rescue training, was 24 kilometers is the absolute max you can walk in a straight line in Nova Scotia and not hit a road or, or a river. And yeah, that, that would be few and far between. I'm thinking that must be the Cape Breton Highlands or something like that. That's my guess. Or possibly in around Kedji, like in through yeah. the... Right. But there's not a lot of spots that you could do this. And the likelihood that if you walk that 24 kilometers, you chose the absolute worst direction. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. And you you'd got almost a, have to be trying uh, to do it. Yeah, if you got a few degrees either way. You'd have been you'd have hit it long before. But yes, um, take take the time to learn some skills. Take some time to learn your equipment. If you got a knife, make sure it's sharp. Make sure it actually you know how to use it. 
otherwise it's it is a danger to you. Oh um, man, a dull knife is far more dangerous than a sharp knife, in my opinion. Sharp knife's predictable. Dull knife, you have no idea what that thing's gonna do. And you, you got your uh, your your matches. It's great if provided you can actually start a fire with a match. There are people who will struggle with that. I, and I've seen what I would normally consider good woods people when their hands are cold and the the, the situation isn't right struggle to get a fire going all the woods wet everything's kind of against them they're, like i said their hands are cold they don't have the dexterity they're used to uh you get frustrated next thing you know the matches are all gone the lighter doesn't work they just you know i don't know keeping your emotions in check that's a big one for anything being out in the woods and i think later on you and i have talked about this we are going to do uh matthew barkhouse it's seven kilometers what seven Isn't kilometers? The farthest you can go in Nova Scotia? It must be. Matt, Matt would know. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Uh, we're going to... Sorry, getting back on track. Ben and I have all talked about this in the past. We're going to do an episode on fire making. And these are all good points we'll probably bring up in that as well. But that that's a big one there. And a lot of people overlook that. Is your emotional awareness has to be kept in check for anything you're doing in the woods, especially if it comes down to a survival situation. But it doesn't have to be a survival situation. Just being in the woods in general. Because if your emotions aren't at least being acknowledged, it's real easy to slip up and goof up. Oh, yeah. 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 And once, you know, once, once you start down the path, each... Each time it gets worse. Like every every failure can add up. So you, you you've lost your temper. You you you're frustrated with your gear. You start making mistakes, and then it starts to compound, and, and the dangers and risks go up. Snowball you know, effect. It, it is. It's the, it it definitely is, and that that's where once you realize that things aren't going right, you really need to stop, take some time, whittle yourself out a little wood spirit. Think about what you're doing. But it's true. I mean, that that's a perfectly good example for something like that. Just take a minute. Take a breath. Yeah. And if things if things will get better if you take some time to think about it, look around, listen. Uh, and and, and if, I mean, it really does come back to what we're talking about. What do you do to, to calm yourself, to, to, control, to, to pass the time, to improve your skills? Uh, I believe on the first bushcrafting weekend, your your wife Mel she did the rope. She made yeah. Yep, and that's, that's, that's oh, a skill I never really tried before. No, and that's that's something both of us do. That's kind of like what we do to keep our hands busy. If we're just sitting around and chatting, we grab what's around us and we just start making rope. One, it get it's great practice for when you actually have to do it. Two, your hands are always busy. And three, you learn a lot about what you can make rope out of, in all honesty, because you literally just grab what's next to you, because, I mean, God forbid, you actually get up and walk around to find good materials. No, 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 good sir. Laziness kicks in, and you will grab what's around you. Um, Chris made a point here I want to touch on. He said, I struggle starting fires with matches, but excel with a ferro rod, which I always carry. Which is a good point. That that happens to a lot of people. And the reason being is because with, or well, I shouldn't say the reason, but one of the reasons or the most common reason I've seen in some of the courses I've taught is people know with a ferro rod, there's a lot of prep involved. You have to get that fine powder. You have to get that real fine kindling. You have to get the next size up. You have to build on it. As where when people get a match, they get a false sense of security going, oh, I'm getting flame right out of the gate. I can skip a lot of the prep work, which is not entirely true. All that's giving you is a flame. You still have to have all the prep work in, on top of it. And the other reason is because matches are prone to blowing out in the wind unless you get storm matches, as were ferro rods. They'll kick sparks regardless. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's there's that 100%. That, that's that's what you need to do is 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 take the time and prep. Build up. Get the, and, and a lot of people make the mistake of not having enough material available so they they grab their, their their tinder, their their small material. They got a few branches around, and they get it laid there. And they maybe got a couple of logs there, and then they they start it. And then of course they don't have the next stages ready, and then they're running around trying to get to it, and then everything burns down. So, you really That's a huge one. Yeah, you want to have it all laid out. And was it? I think the rule of thumb is when you think you have enough, get at least that much again. Four times as much. 
Fort Hines. That, right. That's what I've always been told, or that's the one I go by. If you're, and that that came from, um, if you think you got enough wood for the night, yeah. go get through. You need four times the amount you think you do, and I I bring that down to everything. If you think you got enough tinder, you need four times that amount. If you got enough kindling, you need four times that amount. Now, do you need it? Maybe no. not, but I can guarantee you, it's better to have it and not need it than yeah. need it and it. Like you said, you have to run off and get it because then you've just lost time. You might have had a one-shot deal. Maybe you did have that one match, and now it's all gone to hell. You know what I mean? Like, um, so there was a challenge there for a while, was it? The one-match challenge? Yeah, and then people started splitting them in half and trying to get two matches out of it. And then I seen one crafty bugger trying to split it in four. And it was just like, I don't know if that's in the spirit of the challenge or not, but I guess. I, I've seen both sides of the coin on that one. And I, I myself am not a big fan of matches, in all honesty. Like, I understand they're great, they're good, and all that things, but I am not a fan of matches. I am a fan of Bic lighters. They, oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, exactly. You get 100 lights out of it every time, no problem. And then after a lighter, I'd be to a ferrule rod, and then after a ferrule rod... I would probably even go with a bow drill first, and then I'd be down to matches. I, I'm just not that great with matches. Like, I I shouldn't say I'm not great with them. I just, I don't know. I'm just not a fan of the, the, the match thing. I never have been. I tried making them waterproof. I've tried making them stormproof. I tried making those five-minute matches where you wrap uh, Kleenex around them with a little bit of uh, candle wax dripped on them or something like that to make them burn for a lot longer. I have tried them a hundred different ways and I still just do not come back to matches. No. No, I mean, matches aren't my favorite either. Uh, I think a big thing, though, beyond just the, fight, the the initial spark is having something that extends it. And, and I know Mark's listening, or Matt's listening. So he made a bunch for scouts a little while ago in our it for uh, with uh, just wax and, and uh, sawdust and stuff, something like that that you can take with you, regardless of what method you use to, to get a spark or a flame onto it. That that gives you ten times the chance of getting that fire going, or a hundred times even, right? Oh, for sure. Like those are fire extenders, right? So, but um... boosters or whatever you want to call them, right? Multiplier, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. But all good okay. topics for a, a fire episode for sure. Um, uh, Matt or Matt, <laughs> Chris had another one here, and I was going to mention it, and he beat me to the punch. Here's an odd one for you: meditation. If you practice or are familiar with a simple meditation technique, it can become very useful if you're lost, confused, frustrated, etc., in the woods. And it was one I was going to mention, and it, it was a, sitting in the back of my mind to talk about, and we kind of moved on from it. And like I said, he beat me to the punch. That, that's actually a real good one. And meditation doesn't have to be, you know, like, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean Buddhist monks sitting there, hands folded, eyes closed, slow breathing, stuff like that. It can be as simple as just taking a minute and centering yourself. Like, take that breath, let yourself ease out a little bit. That's a basic meditation. Do that over three or four times. Get the bearing on yourself and then proceed from there. And that, that's, uh, I don't really meditate, so to speak. I'm big for sitting and fire watching, which a lot of people do, which is, once again, a form of meditation, believe it or not, because you're just, you're calming yourself, you're centering yourself, you're staring into something. I used to be big on smoking a pipe and watching the fire. I still love it to this day. Like, I'll smoke a cigar and just stare into a fire for hours. Absolutely love it. Um... But yeah, that's that's something else. If you have the luxury of a fire being there and, you know, if you are lost, something like that, and you just need to calm yourself, just take some nice deep breaths, stare into the fire, look at the colors, look at the shapes, get that, like, fire provide. and I know we're jumping right back into the fire topic, but fire provides comfort in a lot of senses that it's companionship, it's light, it's heat. I mean, uh, that's why arguably one of the most important things for me when I'm out in the woods is having some sort of fire or a source of fire, you know what I mean? Like, to me, when I'm out by myself, that is my companion. I have to look after my companion, look after my fire, and it'll look after me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, a lot of, everything seems to center around, like your camp is centered around. Well, you tossed that away. <laughs> 
Funny enough, but this yeah. is the other thing I do when I'm bored. I carve spoons, and a lot of people do that. This was one I made for Melissa out of a piece of uh, white maple. And now I'm desperately trying to break it on her. <laughs> if you think about the skills, like we, we talk, this is what we're here to talk about a bit, is, is, is what do we make, what do we do? A lot of things that you, you would tend to make does revolve back around the fire. The hooks for ho holding your pot above the fire, uh, tripods, um, the one things that don't, like tent pegs, uh, obviously. Um, something I've carved a ton of that is so simple, uh, a toggle or, 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 or just a straight stick, really, mm -hmm. to help. I don't know if you do this for my pack. I, I hate putting my pack on the ground. I really do, right? I hang on so a tree every chance I can get. Yeah. So I carry a, a length of rope, probably about two feet long with a loop on the end. T run that through around a tree. And then I just take a, a Maryland spike hook I, or hitch, I think. They call it. Just take the loop, pull it up over itself, pull it out, put a stick through, put it through the handle on top of my pack, and it hangs there just above the ground. Keeps yep. everything dry or clean. Um if you end up in a site where I'm too, you might see four or five of those hung around the site, different things hanging off of them. I mean, that's essentially what my hammock hangs on too, right? Uh, it's it's a wider strap to help protect the trees. But that's dead simple. I mean, just a round stick comes very useful. Just, you know, cut it off, no branches. Um, weenie roast sticks. I, do, I, know, I think we <laughs> talked about that before. You said that's something that, – I mean, you do those – Forks. But I do the forks. I do fork roasting weenie or weenie roasting sticks. The the one pointed weenie roasting stick has eluded me my entire life. I either get them too big or too small. I can never seem to do it. Uh, Matt uh, Barkhouse. Bark is that how you yeah. say that? Okay. Yeah, Barkhouse. Yeah. I just wanted to be sure before I butchered it on him. Uh, stop acronym. Stop, think, observe, and plan. So I've heard that before, and that's actually a real good one for centering yourself if you need to uh, get yourself centered in the woods. So that's definitely something good, and that's why I brought mention to it. But uh, yeah, there's lots of things you can do in the woods to occupy your mind. Carving is a big one because most people tend to take a knife into the woods, and it can be as simple as you said, carving a toggle, carve a spoon, carve a, a wood sprite. I mean, just We're gonna whittle. Try. <laughs> we're going to challenge each other with making a whistle when we're up there, I think. We're going to try. We're going to try. <laughs> we're we're going to see if we can get two failed whistles or one of us can actually make a noise or if we can even get the bark off the tree right. That's, I, um, if we can get the bark off the tree right, I think we stand a chance. Yeah. I think that's going to be our make or break, to be honest with you. If I remember correctly, I said my, my father used to make these whistles and he, he did it out of alder. I know it was always alder he used. And he looked for something about bigger around his thumb, maybe a little bit bigger, not much smaller. And he'd carve them out. I can remember the pattern. But he would tap that bark. He'd get it nice and wet and keep tapping it. And then he, he could slide the whole thing right off, do all the carving, and slides it back on. And he made a great little whistle. And that's a great challenge for me and you to try. Um, and it has a somewhat of a practical means, but mostly it's great fun. Um so I'm hoping there's a bunch of alders close by because one's not going to do it. <laughs> we'll find some. It is the Canadian wilderness. I'm sure there'll be alders. Yeah. I hope. We'll keep, you know, see us running through the woods looking for alders. We come uh, out in somebody's backyard. You got any alders, dude? I need some. <laughs> yeah, okay. Me... Keep it up. Keep an eye on your backyard. It's come the 8th and 9th. And if you see two crazy bushmen walking out looking for alders, just throw us some alders. We'll go back into the woods and behave ourselves. <clears throat> give us your alders and everyone will be okay <laughs> all we want is the alders everybody else is safe oh wow that took a sharp digression yeah. ah what about cooking essential skill for sure and can be difficult in the bush so that is another thing that a lot of people do to keep themselves occupied in the bush is learn new ways of cooking and just for that reason it's developing the skills trying things you wouldn't think of uh, was it Matthew you were telling me about the fire bowl technique? Or yes. Or was that somebody else? Okay, so Matt there, uh, just in fire in general, he takes a big bowl and makes his fires on that. We talked about that a little bit in past weeks. And I mean, that's that's a new one to me. And I really want to try it because I think that's going to double as an easy charcoal pit for grilling on. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it definitely is. It's it's a great little method. So you bring, you're bring you bringing one? 
I am going to go to uh, Value Village and see if I can find one. If I can find one, I'm going to try and figure out how to strap this thing in with me, honestly. So that that is that is my goal for this weekend, uh, this coming up. Um, so that's going to be your replacement helmet? You're right. I'm just going to put a little string around it. I mean, it's going to be perfect. I want to get one of those big bowls, too. That way it looks like a flying saucer going down on a motorcycle. <laughs> so right on his bike. <laughs> What are they called? Walks. Is that it? W-O-K? Walk bowls that are like two yeah. feet across or something? Yeah, that's the sucker I want. But uh, no, I, it was a great idea. It intrigued me a lot. And ever since you guys talked about it, I really want to try it, honestly. Because the first thing that kicked in my head, well, that's that's awesome. You get a nice hot bed of coals, throw a grill over it, man. You you got a barbecue. Oh, yeah. So Yeah, we need two bowls for that. And then we can just, you know, we can bake it. Then we have an oven. Like, I mean, now we're getting technical. Now we got bread and muffins, pizza. <laughs> you know, something that I've been trying, uh, failing miserably at, but I'm trying and I've been starting to do it more in the woods and I want to continue developing it, is working with clay, trying to find clay deposits oh, and yeah. working with the proper types of clay to start making uh, different things. Like, uh, I mean, w once you know how to work with clay, and that's all I'm trying to do at this point, I'm not trying to make anything functional, don't get me wrong, beyond like a bowl or something, like if you want to call that functional, but what I'm trying to do excuse me, is find the, the correct clay to use with the correct consistency so that I can harden it and then fire harden it. And I, I know the technique in theory to fire harden it. Like you got to get it hot enough that it should turn red. And then once it cools, uh, it'll turn to kind of almost a porcelain. Like it should make a tinging sound when you ping it. And that's what I'm trying to do is to get, get to there. And I, I know what I'm doing wrong is I'm either finding the wrong type of clay. It's too, um, too gritty. It's not yeah. fine enough, uh, and it might be cooling too fast is the other worry that I'm having now, because once it fire hardens, you'll pull it out of the fire, and that that's not the right thing to do is what I'm, I'm learning. You kind of want to let the fire die down around it and let that cool slowly, because that's where you're going to get a lot of your cracking. I did, I did a lot of research on that. I haven't been successful in finding decent clay myself, uh, but they say when you find the clay, you want to be able to roll it about the size of a pencil. And it should be able to wrap around without breaking or, or, or falling apart. So it needs that consistency. And, and you're right. It is a little difficult to find, you know. Uh, but it is out there. I'm, I'm sure there's plenty of clay in, in Nova Scotia that, that that's good for pottery. But finding it can be tricky. Now, a buddy of mine who's been on the show with us, well, not talking with us, but has listened to it, Marcus English, uh, he's got a property not too far from where I live here in Thorburn and up that riverbank. Um, when he was younger, his, uh, I believe it was grandparents, showed him and he's trying to find it. He was the one that uh, kind of got me into the pottery side of it. And it was amazing clay, according to him. Like it, it had the right consistency. It made beautiful pottery. So he, he started it. We found some clay down by the riverbank. And I think if we refine it a little bit, it'll actually work. And I have looked up some videos and stuff on how to refine clay. And you can take, like, clay that's too gritty and you can refine that down to make it into clay that you can work with. And oh, yeah. that's kind of the, the stage we're at now is we're going to try and refi refine some down till we get it to the point where we can work with it. And then start trying to do um, some of the shaping and hardening. Like I said, starting off, I don't even care if I get anything functional. I just want to get the, the hardening process down a little bit. So you're going for a pipe, right? I'm going for a plate. <laughs> Just slap it down and off I go. Actually, uh, Marcus is pretty good at them. He he made some clay pipes and they hardened out and they worked okay. Uh, yep. But we didn't get them, or I should say he didn't get them hot enough. So they didn't yep. fire harden properly. He tried to do it in an oven and it just it couldn't get the heat to it. But, you watched uh, the Primitive technology, I think it is. I love primitive technology, and I talk to him quite well. I shouldn't say talk to him. I post up a lot of comments and get responses back from him. Let's go with that. So, I say, the man doesn't speak on any of his videos. It's the one I'm thinking of. Yep, uh, but he does comment. If you go, like, oh, yeah, He has oh, yeah. his own website, and if you comment on it, he will respond back. He's really good that way. No, his videos are awesome, and without without a single word being said, you know what he's doing, and it's and he's he's he builds all kinds of amazing things. But one of the first ones I watched, he made himself that kiln. Like, yes, you know, the first thing he made was was uh, the base where he, he made the round 
piece. He put his fingers through it and a bunch of holes, and then he put that on top of the fire, and then he built the chimney around it, and that's where he, he fired all of his bowls and stuff after that, and he made shingles for his, his huts, and, you know. It was actually him that told me that I was probably letting the stuff cool too fast, and that's yeah. why I was getting a lot of cracking. He did say that some cracking is inevitable. Uh, it's just going to be a defect in when you were shaping the clay, but the, the leading cause to major cracking is it cooled too fast and it contracted or and it just it couldn't keep up with the speed of how it contracted and it created a split so yeah. it has to cool down a little slower so that when it's contracting it's more even or yeah. so he explained it to me which is a man that knows way more than i do about working with clay so i'm intended inclined to believe him i i if, if he said it i i would tend to say he probably has a good point or it's something that you should be at least looking at uh no, and that's that's a skill that I've I've looked at quite a bit, and I want to get into the other skill for making that you could do it around a fire or just at the camp that I would love to get into is flint napping. And I've I've watched a ton of videos, I've managed to get a handful of pieces of material. Every now and then I'll walk, I'll see like an old extra thick piece of glass or something on the side of the road. I'll pick it up, bring it home. I got a, a, a handful of material. I really don't want to do it around the house, and it's mainly because it leaves a lot of sharp flakes that you got to clean up and the kids are liable to get into. I Do you have a piece of deer antler? Kind of. Okay, I was going to say, if you don't, I have a couple here uh, oh. that I was actually shaping in, well, not shaping, I was going to use for flint napping. Yeah. Uh, I'll bring you a couple on the trip if you want to bring some of your glass and see what you can do. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm, I, I knew a guy, he, he used to carry, he had a, a walking stick he carried, but he had a, driven a nail into it and he left it sitting out about an inch and a quarter maybe an inch and a half and he used that for some of his work too right i didn't know he could use a nail i knew deer antler worked well because it had the once again i'm not a master of flint napping i know the basic concepts i have done nothing of it of myself but um our biggest drawbacks we don't have flint we have chert which sure. kind of works if you can find it quartz is, is the most common thing around it we got that can be be can it be napped oh yeah yeah Fl quartz is a common one uh, the bottom of beer bottles is actually a great pl place to practice um you put the nail in you put your finger at the top you shake it back and forth and the bottom pops out yep but i got i think it's a piece off one of those insulators on the uh power lines oh like, yeah they're that big around and about an inch and a half thick and i think you should be able to get something awesome out of that I might know where there's a half a dozen of those stashed. My grandfather's old shed before it fell in, yeah. uh, it had a bunch of them in it because we used to walk the railroad tracks, and funny enough, you would find them there because they'd have the old lines running down the railroad tracks, right? And he collected them for years when I was a kid. And I think the garage has fallen in now down there in Bernie's River, but I bet you they're still in the back of it, and I'm going to be going down there to start tearing all that stuff down, so I'll have to keep my eyes open for you. The other thing is uh, we were uh, late... Lake Pinook, Panhook, Pinook, 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 down by Windsor Way. Uh, we were canoeing down through that, and I ended up on a little island. And uh, when I got out, there was a bunch, the ground was super soft, but there was a bunch of rocks more or less floating on it. <laughs> and we got up, and I picked one up, and I hit it with a rock, another rock, and it chipped off beautifully. So you better believe I picked up that rock. Uh, probably about a 40 pound rock and I threw it in a canoe and I dragged it for the rest of the trip so that <laughs> is is up there and I've tried it with the ferro rods and it'll it'll spray rocks off the ferro rods for sure but then I took it against uh, a steel file and I'm shooting sparks off that so it's maybe, hard yeah I was about to say maybe you actually managed to get a big piece of church or something did you? yeah I think I have found a big rock and I know where that came from so i suspect there's a few more pieces down there so it's it'd be any but there's i'm not finding a lot around here not a lot of material that i think actually makes a good shot but you can take a good test is if you have fire steel i know you have one from peter lapak or whatever uh you can use that to test material if you can get a spark off of it you can probably nap it yeah i use uh just a piece of file like you said i keep a if i'm going into the woods and i'm looking for rocks specifically i will uh 
keep a little old file because I don't like beating on that one Peter gave me. It's too nice. But, <laughs> uh, and I have tons of old files around here. Uh, I just keep a piece of one of them and I sand off, or well, didn't sand, I ground off the, uh, the actual file part of it so it's a little smoother and I'll use that. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Yeah, so but, but anything you can pretty well get a spark off, you should be able to get an edge to. Whether to be as good as, as proper flint or chert is, you know. It's debatable. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, flint is probably one of the best. There's no doubt about it. It's got that reputation for a legit reason. And everything from that, chert is basically the same material. Flint's from the area of flint. It's part of, you know, the name. But, uh, so when it comes to Flint, I'll share a little secret. Uh, as some of you guys know there, I'm an instructor for several other courses and classes. And I've met a few people that travel overseas. And the the idea behind Flint coming over here, for what it was told to me, and maybe you can help me on this, Ben, is in Nova Scotia, we don't get Flint naturally. We don't have the right conditions. All the Flint you find here is chert. And if you do find Flint, uh, it came over on boats because they used to put it in as counterbalance. They come over here, get timber dump the rock, load up with timber, and sail back. Yes. So that's yeah. that's where we get flint, so to speak. But I have met some people from overseas where flint is actually fairly prevalent. Uh, I think that's the right word. Yeah, prevalent. And they travel over fairly regularly. And I am in talks with them to see if they will bring me back large quantities of flint. So there is some uh, difficulties with that, with putting large rocks in your carry-on on a plane and stuff like that. But um, we're going to start off small, maybe get a couple of the size of my fists and work yeah. from there. Yeah, I, that's, I think that's a great pass, and it's, and it's amazing. Like, I, I don't know if you've, you've obviously studied it some, but I, 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 in my research, there was a really neat video I watched where they talk about the uh, type, I, I want to say biface is this is the style, and there's an argument. It's quite a quite a convincing one on my part uh, that this biface system that was originally developed was actually developed near Spain. Uh, interestingly enough, and it showed up here in North America about a hundred within a hundred years of it showing up in Spain. And they suspect that North America is actually populated by people that came from both directions, that the, the first people from North America probably wasn't the Vikings, probably wasn't Christopher Columbus or, or Cabot, but essentially hunters that followed the ice flow across during one of the last ice ages. And so some of the people that, populated North America hundreds and hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, came from this side, and they actually went all the way down through North America and started coming up the other side where they met people coming the other way. And then there's been cross-training for hundreds of years. The whole culture that we don't really correctly know and follow. But they found a church that's originally from the East Coast on the West Coast. Okay. And they know that good deposits of, of nappable flint-like material has been traveled and traded over great distances throughout North America. But they, they can follow, using carbon dating and other methods, the progression of, of the technologies for, for working stone. And it's kind of interesting. I'd lo love to know more about it, but it, it was an interesting subject. Um, that might be something worth uh, researching a little bit more maybe we'll have a discussion on that sometime but uh, we're coming up on our one hour now so I'm probably inclined to maybe wrap it up for tonight what about you Ben? yeah well I've got uh, very little left in my battery so I'm, I'm running out of options here <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of where I was too I was starting to grasp and I noticed we we're kind of circling on subjects as well so I think that's probably a good place to Maybe shut her down for tonight. Next week, we'll pick her back up. Uh, if all goes well and we stick to our guns, we only have two more podcasts before we'll go on our little, little outing. Exciting and terrifying at once. 
all exciting and terrifying. So next week, I imagine we'll do another little update, though the updates are pretty much getting uh, the same now. But hopefully, if you have some experience with getting the gear on your bike, you report back to us uh, once I get my bike fixed, which hopefully will be either tomorrow night or the next night. I will start trying to pack my stuff on my bike. And as I uh, mentioned in one of our past pod podcasts, I got a GV mount for the back of my bike, which gives me a little bit more storage space. And I'm going to try and pack that sucker full. Yeah. So we'll see what we can get on that. Maybe we'll report back with that next week. And then on the 5th, I know we're planning really far ahead. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the challenges that we're going to try and do while we're out in the bush. We already did that in the past, but now we'll try and sum them all up. We'll hit a list because I know Chris offered us a few good ones there. And if anybody else is listening, please join us on the 5th at 8.30. And feel free to fill our pockets with any kind of challenges you want us to undertake. I will not promise we'll get to all of them, but we will try to accomplish as many of them as humanly possible with the means we have available to us. And if you're super bored and have no friends in the world, you can always join us. <laughs> absolutely anybody that's interested and wants to join us please get in contact with us we'd love having a few more uh, sets of hands and potentially bodies in the woods so <laughs> it's that much more to huddle together if it stays this freaking cold right yeah yeah i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i love if you just trail all like, yeah the, the yeah, people are problem. Probably, probably not the ones gonna come though yeah <laughs> Yeah, they're just going to throw throw chips and laugh. But, all right, ladies and gentlemen, that wraps it up for me tonight. Chris, thanks for joining us as always. You have yourself a good night. Uh, Adam, Terry, uh, Trey, Trey I, I guess, sorry. Uh, sorry, just getting back to that. I just noticed it now, Trey, the fishing and other methods of acquiring food. Uh, we did talk about that in a previous podcast, and we'll probably touch it again in the future. Uh, if you haven't listened to the previous ones, please grab them off the Atlantic Bushcraft website. Ah, uh, see that plug right there, Ben? And, um, yeah, and for sure, we'll talk about it again in the future. All right, that's it for me. Night off.